So good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Kat McGregor. And on behalf of the Farm Advisory Service, I'm here tonight with my colleague, Kathleen Gunn. And we're going to be talking about all things um, carbon related. Um, there's so much talk in the news and on social media, et cetera, of uh, lowering emissions, carbon footprint, net zero, uh, greenhouse gases. But for a lot of people, it's understanding what does it all actually mean. So tonight, our plan of attack, guys, is to hopefully break down all that jargon and give you all a better understanding of what those kind of buzzwords are that you're hearing the whole time and what it means to us as farmers and crofters. So tonight, guys, um, I want, I'm hoping by the end of the session, everything is a little bit clearer to you all. Um, we want to encourage you all to ask as many questions as possible and try and make it quite an engaging session. So if you have any questions, folks, if you can just pop them in the, the chat, se chat session that's on your screen. And Katerina is just going to move to the next slide for me. Um, and there we go. Um, at the bottom of your, your screens, folks, you'll see a little menu option that comes up and you can either raise your hand to ask a question, you can type it in the chat function and you can choose to type the question directly to everybody that's in the chat or you can direct it at myself or if you want to direct it at Kathleen, Kathleen can collate all the questions as we're going along this evening. And um, we'll also have a Q&A session at the end, guys, if there's anything that springs to mind um, as the presentation is going on. Um, and if you're feeling brave enough, by all means, you can come off of, um, off of mute and have a, have a chat with us. Everybody has joined the, the call tonight on mute, so we can't hear anything. It just blocks out all the background noise, guys. So um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to our speaker tonight. Um, I do have a few slides at the very end of the presentation tonight, but our speaker tonight is Katerina Carpaccio. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. hopefully that's the right pronunciation. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Katerina is part of our AgriCalc team um, and she has very kindly offered to come along tonight and speak with us and, and try and explain and break down the barriers of, of all the different kind of carbon related um, confusion that's out there. So I'm going to hand you over to Katerina who is just going to take us through the slides folks. See so if you've got any questions don't be shy. Kathleen's popped a little chat into the chat box there just now to welcome everyone to the meeting. So, um, so guys yeah any questions you've got feel free to fire them at us and we'll answer them as best as we can either throughout the presentation or at the end. So Katerina over to you. Thank you Kat. Good evening everyone. Um, it's a pleasure uh, being here and I'm very happy that, uh, to have been invited. Um, like uh, Kat already said there's a lot of talk about carbon emissions, greenhouse gases, uh, net zero. So um, today we're going to look at what all this terminology means, hopefully simplify it, uh, understand farm carbon impacts and how to reduce our farm carbon impacts. Um, all the various discussions and the jargon around carbon and net zero and so forth, all begin with climate change. But before talking about climate change, uh, let me start by saying a little bit about what is climate and, and how climate and weather are not the same thing. So um, climate is the average weather in a place or a region over many years. Weather is a specific event like um, a rainstorm or a hot day that happens over a few hours or days. So whether it's the day-to-day -day change in temperature and rainfall, for example, in a place. And we can describe the weather just by looking outside. Uh, if it's raining right now, then that's today's weather. And the weather can change very quickly. Um, but weather and climate, as I've, already, as I've already said, are not the same thing. Climate is the usual weather in a place over a long period of time. Um, it's, it's the average weather conditions over 30 years or even more. So climate changes much more slowly than weather. And in fact, the Earth's climate has been stable for over 9,000 years. However, 
In the last couple of decades, average temperatures in the Earth's surface have risen. And this affects local climates all over the world. Uh, climate change includes both global warming and all the resulting shifts in weather patterns. So climate change is a large scale and long-term shift in weather conditions uh, in the planet's average climate conditions. Climate change, as you've probably heard over the news for the last quite a few years, it affects all regions all over the world. For example, there's polar ice caps melting, uh, sea levels are rising. In some regions, um, extreme weather events like heavy rainfall or floods are becoming co more common while other regions are experiencing and suffering from extreme wave, uh, heat waves and intense droughts. And unfortunately, all of these impacts are expected to intensify in the coming decades. So climate change has had detrimental effects in various sectors all over the world, including here in Scotland. And one of these sectors is agriculture. Few of the main consequences of climate change on agriculture include flooded uh, fields and crops, droughts, and even an increase in pests and diseases, uh, all of which decrease productivity. Therefore, climate change makes it more difficult to grow crops, to raise animals, and to catch fish in, in the same ways and the same places as done until now. All this leads to socioeconomic vulnerabilities. It threatens the rural economy. It threatens global food security and it threatens livelihoods worldwide. So what causes climate change? Um, well, all of these changes in the Earth's climate um, are obviously, they're not natural shifts. Instead, various human activities uh, release gases that change the makeup of the Earth's atmosphere, that, that change the composition of the atmosphere. And these gases, as you've heard before, are known as greenhouse gases. And the reason they're called greenhouse gases is because they make our atmosphere better at trapping heat, trapping the sun's heat. I'll go more into this in, uh, uh, in, the, in the next slide. Many of the greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide uh, occur naturally in the Earth's atmosphere. How, however, because of the, of the human activities uh, uh, after the industrial revolution, the amounts of greenhouse gases have increased significantly. Here's a graphic illustration of the greenhouse effect. And so there's the earth that is surrounded by a layer of, of, of gases that make up the atmosphere. And during the day, the sun shines through the atmosphere and warms up the earth. At night, the earth cools down by releasing heat back towards space but some of that heat is trapped in the atmosphere. And it's trapped by those naturally occurring greenhouse gases that are useful because they keep our earth warm and cozy, warm enough to sustain life. However, as I've already said, it's the increased amount of these gases that, that causes uh, the, the atmosphere to trap more and more heat. And just like a greenhouse, the average temperature of the earth rises, leading to climate change. Um, so, um, yes, the primary source of human generated greenhouse gases 
is the burning of fossil fuels. Uh, fossil fuels like oil, gas, coal, that are used to generate electricity and heat and also used for transportation. Other human uh, generated emissions come from deforestation, uh, various industrial processes, as well as fertilizer use and livestock production. The three greenhouse gases you see here in this slide, uh, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide, are the main, let's say, the main culprits of, of, of the greenhouse effect and consequently climate change. Their amounts in, in, the, in our atmosphere has skyrocketed in recent decades. For example, carbon dioxide has increased by more than 20% in the last 40 years. That, that's a lot. It's about a fifth more than it used to be 40 years ago. And so today, the, the, the leading cause of climate change are greenhouse gases. So where and how does agriculture fit into all of this? The main greenhouse gases emitted by uh, farming practices are carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. Carbon dioxide is mostly emitted from burning of fossil fuels, as I've said, that are used in this case to power agricultural machinery. Um, other common practices, farming practices that result in significant carbon dioxide release include intensive tillage and overgrazing, uh, as well as uh, the use of fossil-based herbicides, pesticides, and fertilizers. Uh, methane. Methane is produced mostly by ruminant digestion uh, from, for example, sheep or cattle, and also from manure storage and decomposition. Nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide uh, is generated by the addition and application of uh, synthetic fertilizers and also from manure management. So, so most, most farm-related emissions come from methane and nitrous oxide. And, and this makes up about 65% of agricultural emissions worldwide. Just grab a bit of water. Carbon footprints, that's a term we hear a lot uh, almost on a daily basis. Uh, what's a carbon footprint? It's the total amount of greenhouse gases, the ones I've already talked about, the total amount of these gases that is produced by a person, by an activity, by an event, a product, a service, an organization, or a community. I'd like to note here it's a bit technical, but I'll, I'll try to make it as, as simple as possible. Um, that the, the different greenhouse gases, they do not contribute to the greenhouse effect to the same extent. They don't have the same strength at trapping heat in the atmosphere. So in order to make the greenhouse gases comparable, there's the so-called global warming potential. And this is just an index that describes the warming effect and the potency of each greenhouse gas in comparison to carbon dioxide. Just to give you an example, uh, methane is, is about 25, uh, 25 times more potent uh, than carbon dioxide at trapping heat in the atmosphere. And nitrogen is about 300 times more potent than carbon dioxide. Uh, so in order to be able, in order to make carbon accounting simpler and more straightforward and more balanced, uh, a carbon uh, greenhouse uh, gas footprint is measured as a carbon dioxide equivalent. So when you hear about carbon dioxide equivalent, it means there's 
been a calculation done to 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 consider the the strength of each greenhouse gas. Carbon accounting is just um, simply it's a process that is used to calculate a carbon footprint. It's not a simple process, but that's what it basically means. Uh, and carbon accounting is also sometimes known as a carbon inventory or a greenhouse gas inventory. Net zero, another term that's uh, quite famous in the last few years. Um, most often net zero is referred to as a target for, for cutting the carbon emissions that cause climate change. But what does a net zero actually mean? Put simply, net zero refers to the balance between the amounts of greenhouse, greenhouse gases that are produced and the amount of greenhouse gases that are removed from the atmosphere. You can try to think about it a bit like a bath. So uh, when you turn the taps on, you add more water into the bathtub. You pull the plug out and water flows out. And the amount of the water in the bath depends on both the input from the taps and the output through the plug hole. In order to keep the amount of the water in the bath at the same level, we need to make sure that the input and the output are balanced. And this, and this same principle applies to reaching net zero. So it requires to balance the amount of greenhouse gases we emit into the atmosphere with the amount that we remove from the atmosphere. So when what we add is no more than what we take away, that's when we reach net zero. In order to prevent the worst and most catastrophic climate changes, the international scientific community has reached a consensus that global uh, human caused carbon emissions must reach net zero by, two, uh, by 2050, 2050. And in fact, the UK um, became the world's first global major economy to set a target of net zero by 2050. Uh, Scotland is even more ambitious. Uh, Scotland has committed to reach net zero by 2045. And Wales has aligned with the UK target, but with ambitions to get there sooner. Just a note here um, about the Scottish agricultural sector. The Scottish agricultural sector in 2018, just three years ago, carried about 18% of Scotland's total emissions. And that's about a fifth of the total of Scottish emissions that are produced by agriculture. So agriculture needs to achieve emission reductions at a much faster rate than has been achieved to date. Why does net zero matter? Why does net zero farming matter? The successful implementation of net zero will have numerous positive impacts, especially in the long term. First of all, emissions will decrease. And this will mitigate, will help mitigate the impacts of climate change. We'll have greater biodiversity, healthier animals, healthier soils, a better climate, which will all cause farm productivity and efficiency to improve. Food security will also increase. And all these positive outcomes will, will will help to increase agricultural resilience. Furthermore, the increase in, in farm efficiency will lead to a decrease in demand for agricultural land. So, this. 
So there will be more land available for carbon capture. And this will lead to a potential to offset emissions further and therefore mitigate further climate change impacts. So there, there's a lot of, of benefits that might not be visible uh, in the short term, but in the long term are not only beneficial, but absolutely necessary. How, how can we achieve net zero? Uh, how can we achieve net zero farming? There's a number of things that individual farms can do to reduce their emissions and their carbon footprint. And here I'll, I'll share a few examples. Um, so for example, uh, improving forage quality um, by changing livestock feeds uh, methane emissions can be reduced significantly. Um, another example is manure management. Uh, manure can be managed in such a way to reduce methane and nitrous emissions. Um, for example, by covering manure storage facilities and by optimizing uh, manure applications to the soil. Um, other, other practices to reduce nitrogen applications or synthetic fertilizers without reducing yields uh, are slow, slow release fertilizers and nitrification inhibitors. Other things uh, that can help reduce a carbon footprint, a farm carbon footprint, are machinery choice and fuel use. So if we manage to use less fuel, less fossil fuel like diesel, for example, uh, that will decrease significantly uh, the carbon dioxide emitted on the farm. This can happen, for example, by adopting uh, techniques, uh, practices uh, that use less fuel, for example, minimum tillage or no till. And another important thing you can do is to make sure that uh, all heating and cooling systems are in good working order. Apologies, I have to keep moving this window. Uh, so another, another uh, practice that could help is uh, replacing fossil fuels with renewable energy sources. There's lots of examples uh, lots of examples, uh, for example, you can install uh, solar uh, panels or a wind turbine. There's also biofuel production from crops or crop residues. And then there are various other practices that you can use to help sequester or capture carbon in the soil. For example, uh, multifunctional land use, such as agroforestry or agroecology. There's tree planting or cover crops. Also by reducing or eliminating fallow in crop rotations, this can help to increase uh, carbon sequestration in the soil. There's lots of options and I'll give you in the next, uh, in the next few slides uh, uh, resources you can use. Um, and to get ideas uh, on how to, to do that. Another option is to use a carbon calculator here that helps to manage and reduce emissions. Carbon footprint calculators have become a very popular tool um, for personal use or for uh, businesses and organizations. So these tools, these calculators, uh, allow people or organizations to assess their behavior and their activities and to see how these activities impact the environment. Knowing our carbon footprint makes it much easier to get involved in reducing that footprint. So being able to manage and reduce farm carbon 
comes by being able to measure it. Farm carbon calculators usually cover arable and livestock enterprises. And depending on the calculator, they calculate carbon footprint in three different ways. They can calculate uh, carbon footprints uh, for the whole farm per enterprise, for example, beef or sheep or dairy, cereals, uh, fruit and veg, or they can calculate the footprint by saleable product. Calculators, these calculators express carbon footprints as tons of carbon dioxide equivalents, as we've talked about before. And they give the breakdown of emissions by source. And some calculators also include greenhouse gas type. Such an example of a farm carbon calculator is AgriCalc, which is a tool developed by SAC Consulting together with uh, Scotland's rural college researchers. And it's a tool that is designed to identify and quantify emissions by source and type of greenhouse gas. It's designed to monitor improvements and to benchmark key performance indicators. And it also has the ability to identify and recommend mitigation strategies. So AgriCalc, is a tool that supports farmers and agriculture in general to achieve a net zero future uh, while increasing production and efficiency on the farm. Farming for a better client is another way uh, to, to get practical uh, information and ideas about how to act and to reduce farm carbon footprint and to help improve farm efficiency. This is a, it's a farmer led initiative and it's there to help uh, drive low carbon and sustainable uh, farming practices in Scotland. It's run by SRUC, Scotland's Rural College on behalf of the Scottish government. And you can find information on their website as well as on their Facebook account and Twitter accounts. And so this is where I, Kat, will go on to talk about carbon audits. Yeah, sure. Okay, so we'll just swap over screens, I think. Um, bear with me, folks. Can everybody see my screen now? Yeah, just my slides. Yep. Okay. Sorry, guys. I'm I'm kind of looking off to the side the whole time because I've got I'm working with two monitors. Um, so, Katrina, thank you very much for that, folks. I hope that's given um a bit of an overview for you on um some of the buzzwords and the jargon that you hear um day in day out. There's a few questions that have come into the chat and come through to us privately, so we'll we'll, we'll come to them in just a wee moment. So, moving on from what Katrina has just said to us, um. A way to, to measure your carbon footprint, folks, and some of you may have already done this before or sorry, might be looking sorry. into it. Yeah, Kat, um, we're not seeing your presentation, we're just we're actually seeing the whole PowerPoint. Can you see it now? Yes. Thanks. Is that better? Okay, apologies. So, um, yeah, so folks, um, some of you may know what a carbon audit is, may have been part of the process, have no idea what it is. So I'm, I'm just going to cover it off for you. So, um, a carbon audit, basically, it's going to measure your carbon footprint. And irrespective if you're a croft, smallholder, farmer, it, it, it doesn't matter what size you, you farm at. Um, it's basically the first step in establishing a baseline for your carbon footprint. Um, a carbon audit will allow you to uh, measure and understand your energy use um, through looking at different factors across your enterprises. Um, it will then basically you would be given a, a report of, of how you perform and you'll be benchmarked against other enterprises of the same nature. 
So how is it measured, folks, across the greenhouse gas emissions that Katrina has already spoken about? Um, we look at each enterprise that you have on your croft or your farm, um, and depending what you farm, how you croft, the way you do things will dictate how we put the, the data into AgriCalc. Um, as Katrina has already said, that, that's the tool that we use here in the, in the SAC. So we, we try to take it by all the measurements of the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so carrying out a carbon audit um, will look at your land use, how much land you have, what you farm, if it's crops, if it's grass, if it's woodland, how it's grazed. Um, we also look at the um, fertilizer, any pesticides that's used for crop inputs. We look at yields, if people know what their yields are, most, most farmers will know um, what their, their yield is year on year for whatever crop it is they're growing. Um, and how it's allocated, if it's sold off farm or if it's allocated to the enterprises there that's on the farm. Um, we also look at stocking densities, um, livestock weights, all the livestock that has been sold, purchased, um, what has unfortunately died on farm, um, and the percentages if you have them for like lambing and calving. We also look at the purchased bedding, anything that's bought in, including feed and the different types of feed. We then look at um, the electricity usage and um, any other fuel usage across the farm. And if external transporters are used for taking livestock away or bringing livestock on, um, and then any renewables, obviously there's a lot of farms out there that you know, maybe have solar panels, windmills, um, different renewables that they're, that they're using. So basically your, your carbon audit consultant would, would run through a whole list of different questions um, trying to get all the information that they require um, to, you know, to put into AgriCalc, which will then produce a whole load of different kind of reports, folks. This is just at a glance. This is nobody in particular, folks. Um, this gives you an idea of the kind of um, stats, I suppose, that you would see. And it would be explained to you what, what it all means. Um, so I'm hoping you can see my, my mouse. Oh, maybe you can't see my mouse in my cursor. But you can see down the left-hand side there all the elements that have been um, measured as part of the carbon audit, um, entric fermentation, manure management, fertilizer, et cetera. Um, and it shows you where you are on your holding, and then it will do a comparison against other holdings of the same kind of enterprise. Um, now, it's not going to be exact. If you have 50 cows and 20 sheep, we're not going to find an exact match to compare you with. But um, if you look over the right hand side column um, where it says physical performance of enterprises, it gives you um, a rough idea of where you sit in comparisons to enterprises of the, of the same kind of nature. Um, so that's just a snapshot, folks. I don't want to bamboozle you with stats and figures, etc. cetera. Um, but that's just one of the reports that is generated as part of the carbon audit. But see, it's to give you a baseline to where, to where where you can start trying to measure your carbon footprint and try to make improvements where you possibly can. Um, thankfully, carbon audits are funded. And if you're having your first carbon audit, um, you can have funding or you can apply for funding up to the value of £500. And then any sequential audits after that, you can apply for funding up to £250 um, for a consultant to, to um, carry out the audit on your behalf. Um, and then you would get a, a document at the end of it um, that details what your carbon footprint is. Um, I guess it, it's kind of mixed how people feel about their carbon audits. Um, a lot of people will have it done as an exercise, so they've got a, a benchmark to start from and will actively try to look to reduce that. And we'll have regular carbon audits carried out to try and see where they are, if they're improving or where they're making improvements or unfortunately where they're not making improvements. But there's lots and lots of different factors, folks. Um, but sitting down with a, a consultant on a one-to-one -one basis and going through all the information, the carbon audit um, report is only as good as the data that goes into it at the end of the day. So um, if you're thinking about getting a carbon audit done, um, by all means, have a log on to the Farm Advisory website. There's a lot of really useful information there, folks, um, and it'll you know, explain maybe in a little bit more depth than what I have tonight. Um, but I think it's something most people should probably think to consider because you know, Katrina's already explained there how we're, you know, we're going net zero. There's all these amb ambitious targets that the government wants to wants to meet, and they've got to be able to um, measure and monitor them along the way. And I guess um, there's to be able to do that, 
there's no, you know, we can't rule out the fact that maybe our basic payment, you know, may one day, um, you know, be carbon related in, in some capacity. Um, that's not set in stone, but they need to have some tool to measure and try and push farmers and crofters down the way to be um, more carbon savvy, I think is, is the wording that I'm looking for. So, um, so yeah, that's just a little bit, a little bit of a flavour on, on carbon audits, folks. Um, and then that brings us to the end of our, our presentation for tonight. So, um, Kathleen, has any questions? There was one or two questions that I think that had started to come in. Yes. Um, um, one to kick off, I don't know if uh, Katrina will have this percentage to hand, but uh, you mentioned that uh, 65 percent of agricultural emissions come from uh, nitrous oxide um, cows quite often get the um the bad press with mm -hmm. methane do you know what percentage as an agricultural average comes from methane um the 65 percent includes both methane and nitrous oxide emissions oh sorry sorry it's both oh it's okay um so based on that, I, I, mean, I don't know, I can, uh, yeah. I don't know by heart the numbers, but I can look if you want to know about the methane in spe specifically, or is th does that answer the question? No, I think that, answers, yes, it's okay. 65 between uh, methane and nitrous oxide. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so sorry, just bear with me, I've just gone back to the start of the questions on this, the generic um, slide there. Um, there's a question here. Why is biogenetic, sorry, bio, biogenic methane not being calculate, calculated using GWP? It is only a fossil fuel methane emissions that are mentioned at the mentioned level. Um, total fossil fuel methane emissions from industry and leakage from natural geological sources are 60 to 110% greater than the past estimates and inventories. Or is that maybe too? Too, uh, mm -hmm. too high level for the... It's a bit yeah. high level, but I can definitely definitely uh, have a look and get back to Jane, if there is a, if that's okay. Yep, yep, I can, yep. Yep, yeah, folks, and we'll take a note of any questions and come back to, you know, come back with anything that, you know, needs clar further clarification, that's, that's no problem. Um, sorry, does AgriCalc consider pasture management the holistic grazing, mob grazing to increase SOM, more infiltrations, the soil biome increase, etc. I don't know if that's Kat or Katrina. So this is a pasture yeah. management holistic mob that grazing. Consider it. So I'm just rereading the question, Kathleen, to increase yeah, yeah. SOM water uh, pasture management is definitely part of agriculture as, as we're going through and inputting all the data in and, and how the percentages of livestock are grazed. So um, if, if you do mob graze, there, there's definitely an option within agriculture to record the percentages of how the, the grassland is grazed. So I would say, yes, that, that's, that's definitely covered off. Uh, water infiltration, soil, biome increase, etc. cetera. Um, water infiltration, I'm not 100% sure of that, but I can find out. Um, Catherine, I don't know if you're aware of that. I can't think of anywhere where that is recorded. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't remember seeing that either. No, no. It might well be there, but um, again, it's something that we can clarify, Jean. That, that's no problem. No problem. And one question that came through to me here, guys, is um, how long does it take to carry a carbon audit? And is it done on farm or on the croft? So the carbon audit itself, folks, um, it will take as, as long as it takes you to get your information gathered for it to be input into the system. Um, it may only take a couple of hours. It may take a little bit of prep from the croft or the farmer that's looking to pull the, pull the information together. Um, normally what would happen um, now that COVID is, is hopefully um, in, in the background, a consultant would come out um, to farm and would sit and go through you know, facts and figures with you, um, look at all your data, um, and it would all kind of be, be done at the time on farm. What they don't do, and I think there's a little bit of confusion, is the consultant doesn't walk around the farm looking at your farming practices. That, that's not part of the carbon audit process. Um, it is very much looking at the data and the, and the stats and the, the figures that you have. Um, so, it, yeah, it could take a couple of hours. It could take half a day. It doesn't tend to take much longer than that, if I'm being honest. Agriculture, um, is it 
primarily used by in, in, uh, small farms or is there a, a, a large range of uh, business types that use agri-calc? Any, any type of business, small, large, yeah. 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 yeah, I think across the board, you know, we've carried out carbon audits for people that have, you know, a handful of sheep, maybe half a dozen sheep, a dozen sheep, up to, you know, farmers that have um, hundreds, if not thousands of sheep on estates, etc. And um, so it's across the whole spectrum. It, and Katrina, correct me if I'm wrong, but it doesn't matter what scale you farm at, um, AgriCalc will cater for all eventualities. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't matter, no. the size doesn't matter. Okay. Um, I just wanted to make a, a comment on one of the previous questions asking about soil organic matter, uh, whether agriculture can uh, measure uh, soil organic matter. It doesn't measure soil organic matter, but there's the soil carbon module uh, that, that's been added that can measure soil carbon and soil carbon is directly related to soil organic matter. If that uh, makes it any clearer to Jane. Um, sorry, Debbie, Debbie's just asked, um, she's, she's on the ball and she's done three agricalcs to date, um, but she's only been able to compare her results um, with her previous results. Um, how does she go about comparing them to other farms and enterprises? Yeah, Katrina, you want me to? So, um, Debbie, when, when you go on to AgriCalc, it maybe it depends what level of um, access you have when you're looking at the reports. It's maybe something we could we could take off offline. I, I know here how we would do it, um, but I'd have to see if your access level is, is the same to that. We have the ability to, to run different reports to see comparisons either against yourself as a business or to select enterprises of a similar nature. So, um, yeah, Debbie, maybe I can pick up with you tomorrow on that one and we'll have a wee look and just check that out for you. Hope that's okay. Um, yeah. I've um, got one that's come in here, Kathleen, um, and it's, uh, is there a certain time of year or a best time of year for a carbon audit to be carried out? Um, and the answer to that is, is, is no, not really. Um, some people will do it on the calendar year, they will do it on their financial year, they'll do it once they scraped all their figures and facts and information together. So there's no wrong or right time, it's just whatever, whatever suits the, the, the farmer, the, the client that's having the carbon audit carried out. And following on from that, Kat, um, mm -hmm. did you, I think maybe, sorry, it was a, how long does it take for the actual audit to be carried out. Yeah. Or yeah. is that, it's very, that'll be, yeah, as, as I said. Depends on your enterprise, how many enterprises you have. Yeah, some, somebody had asked that earlier. Yeah, so it, it, it just depends how long it's gonna take to collate all the information together. Been out and done a carbon audit in less than a couple of hours, I've done a carbon audit that maybe takes, you know, half a day, just over half a day. Again, it depends how, good the figures are, if, if the figures are ready. If not, sometimes you're asking questions that maybe people aren't 100% prepared for, like their diesel usage through the year. Um, and then that takes a little bit of a fact-finding mission to go and dig out receipts and look at accounts and bits and pieces to be able to quantify that. So um, yeah, it's a wee bit how long is a piece of string, but I mean, it does, doesn't take forever. It doesn't take forever. And um, what we tend to do before we go out to do a carbon audit is, um, send out almost like a hit list, a little tick sheet of the, the kind of information we'd be looking to, to gain to, to plug into AgriCalc. So um, it, we, don't, we don't go out and just put you on the spot, folks. You know, we, we, do, um, we do have a, a list of stuff that you can try and prepare before the, the visit or, um, you know, and you need to tick it off as you go along. So yeah, it, it doesn't take too long. It doesn't take too long normally. All right, uh, there's another one coming in the chat. But I, it's, I'm sorry, it's um, there's I don't we don't know the answer. It's maybe um, it, we're just here from an agricultural point of view. But is there plans afoot in Scotland to fine or penalise householders for their food waste? It's not something that we're aware of, but it's something that we can certainly look into. Um, but yeah. Okay, just taking that. Um, Folks, is there is there any more questions tonight? Anybody have any anything else they would like to ask? Um, I think there's a question I can see here. Oh, okay. 
is a focus uh, just on net zero enough when considering the loss of biodiversity and degradation of soils? Both of these have significant implications for the future in our ability to produce oh. nutritious food and the state of the biosphere. Well, first of all, um, biodiversity, it's a, it's, it's, it's a whole topic by itself. So the loss of biodiversity is not only because of the greenhouse effect and so it, it's it's something it, it's some net zero won't be enough to 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 stop the loss of biodiversity it will help it will definitely help because of the climate change impacts but there's also other factors that uh, need to be corrected for uh, recovering biodiversity. And also the same applies for the degradation of the soils. Okay. So that last question, okay folks. I think, have we covered off all the questions that came through those, uh, the chat and the, there's just one just come in. Is there any support or training plans for women on farms? Okay, so it, yeah. So it, is there any support or training plans for women on farms in creating mindset change and educating our children, the next uh, and or next generation of farmers in climate change? I don't know of anything specific, but obviously there's RET that runs the program through the through the schools. Um, you know, that will be, be covering all elements of, of farming and agricultural for, for children. Um, I'm not aware of anything, certainly not being run through the, the SAC. Lantra has different training opportunities um, that, that might be an option and they are trying to promote their, their um, training for, for women in ag. Um, but yeah, not, um, not, not anything that I'm, I'm directly involved in or that, I, that I'm aware of, unless Katrina or Kathleen, you know, you know of any any programs out there? Uh, not maybe not specifically towards children and the next generation, yeah. but there is the farming for a better climate. Yep. Um, and through FAB's advisory service as well, you know there is um, there's different topics that cover. Yeah, there's different. Like yeah, there are there are different options through there. Or different options there. Yeah, different yeah definitely. From um, from managing biodiversity to um, planting trees you know it all has its place yeah, yeah. in agriculture towards um, towards these targets yeah okay folks last shout for any more questions become so yeah. sorry yeah. did you see that one cat there yeah it's asking about further grant schemes plan to help businesses alter to become more efficient yeah well let, let's hope i think you know at the moment um there is um there's barely any grant aid available for anything at the moment and um, it's certainly a question that's been put forward there was the sax grants to to try and help um but that 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 purse is closed at the moment. So I think as um, everything kind of progresses into next year, we'll have a better idea of what funding and what schemes and you know what grants might be available out there. It's certainly a question that has been asked, um, Fiona. So yeah, let, let's hope so. Let's hope so. And if there is, we'll be able to do a webinar on it to explain it all to you. <laughs> so. Okay, folks. So um, I'm aware that we're kind of getting towards the end of the end of the evening folks if anybody has any more questions or they go off the phone tonight uh, or they go off the off their zoom session tonight and think um you know i wish i'd ask this or what about that please by all means um pop it in an email to myself uh, or or kathleen um i'm cat.mcgregor could have had my email address up there cat.mcgregor at sac.co.uk um, Kathleen is kathleen.gun at sac.co.uk um, and we can take any questions away and try and get answers to, to some of the ones especially the ones that weren't maybe all 100% agricultural kind of based we'll, we'll do our best to come back to you 
Okay, guys, so I think that might just bring us to the end of this evening. Um, Katerina, thank you so much for your time tonight. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed the, the presentation and I really hope that the, the objective tonight was for you to leave the, the, the Zoom call tonight um, feeling that you know a little bit more about all those kind of keywords that are, are being banded about in social media. Um, there'll be a recording available very shortly, folks, on the FAS website of tonight's meeting, along with um, the, the presentation and the, the slide pack. Um, that'll be available to anybody that wants to view it. Um, folks, I don't have anything more to add tonight, so I can only really thank you for your attendance tonight. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this evening um, and enjoy the rest of your evening. And I will be in touch soon with our next Women in Ag date for um, our next meeting. I don't have any subject or topic, so if anybody has any great ideas and wants to put them across to me, um, we'll certainly take on board any of the feedback that we get, guys, and we'll, we'll try and make a meeting out of, of, of what you guys are looking for. So, folks, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you so much for your time and uh, take care, and we will see you all soon.